All right, good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to Arlington Baptist Church. Glad you can make it to service this morning. Let's all stand as we begin our service. Sing with us as we start this service. He is exalted. The king is exalted on high. Sing it out this morning as we praise the king of kings. He is exalted. The Jesus this morning. No other name but the name of Jesus. Sing it out on that chorus with me. No other name but the name of Jesus. No other name. Amen. He truly is worthy of all glory and honor and praise. Aren't you glad you're in God's house today? Man, I tell you what, I just, I'm so excited when I get to sing with God's people. I sing by myself all week long. So when you can join with me, you help me. And I help you, don't you think? Say yes anyhow. All right, good. It's a blessing to sing his praise. He's so good to us. He's a great God, and we're so glad that He's with us at all times. He is worthy of all that. Thank you for singing it with me today.
Let me do this before we pray. If you're visiting today, we're so glad to have you. We welcome you here to Arlington, and we're glad that you're here with us. And we always consider it a privilege and an honor to have guests with us. We have those that are maybe watching by way of internet. We're glad they're watching also. But those of you that are here today, that are visiting, we welcome you. Our ushers want to give you something. So if you're visiting today, first time here, first time in a long time, whatever it is, they want to hand you something. So put your hand up wherever you're at if you're visiting today, and we want you to have something that we get to give you a little more about ourselves, and then we get to know a little bit more about you. And in just a little bit, when the offering plate comes by, if you will, before that, just fill out that card that's there, drop it in the offering plate. That way we get to know you a little bit better. But it's so glad to, so good to have you with us today, and we're glad to welcome you. Let's ask the Lord to just bless and use this service in a special way as only He can. Our Heavenly Father, we're so glad to be here today. We're thankful for the fact that we can sing your praises. And we're looking forward to having just a great service today because we want to do this. This is our purpose, Lord. Lord, we want to glorify your son. We want to learn more from your word. We want to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, use everything we say and do to do that. If there's someone that's come here today, it's someone that's watching by way of internet, but they've uh, either one, Father, if they don't know Christ as their Savior, I ask that this would be the day of salvation. How thrilling it was last week to see one walk the aisle to trust Christ as Savior. We rejoiced in that all week long. And we'll continue to do that because that rings the bells of heaven. That gets all of heaven excited when those sinners come to know you as Savior. And so, Father, may this be the day of salvation for those that do not know you. Also, Father, I ask today that maybe those that come in with a, a weary heart, maybe discouraged, uh, maybe needing just encouragement from your word, give it to them, Lord. Pray that they'll be come out of here with a freshness and a strength in you that only is found when we yield ourselves to you. So work in our hearts. And Father, in all honesty, it might be some that come in today and may be drawn away from you this week. And I ask that you would draw them near to you and that lives would be opened and their hearts would be open to receive what you have for them. You're a great God. May the music today bring honor and glory to you. I'm so thankful for Ray and Ann Gibbs. I'm thankful for this couple, their love for you. And, and as they sing your praises today, I believe it's going to encourage us also. And I know it's going to bring you honor. So bless them today, Father, and use them. May the preaching of your word, the singing, everything bring honor and glory to thee. For we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. All right. Thank you. You may be seated.
Jesus' blood. Amen. Let's all stand as we continue singing this morning. Words will be up on the screen. Let's sing together. Because he lives, God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. Sing out on that first. God sent his son. Once again, and let me give you a few announcements that we'll make mention to you, and then ushers will be ready. We'll receive the offering. Uh, first of all, don't forget that tonight we have our service this evening and uh, down in the chapel. Looking forward to it. Great services that we have on Sunday night. And tonight was just going to be extra special. Uh, I don't know if I contain myself. All right. Uh, not only will we have just our normal service, but also we'll have tonight Rain and Gibbs singing for us tonight. And uh, after you hear them this morning, you're going to say, man, I'm coming tonight. And so make sure that you're here tonight, and it'll be a great service, and you'll not want to miss it. And uh, tonight also they'll be giving their testimonies, and uh, it, will, it will touch your heart. And so I hope you'll be with us tonight. Have a great service. And then don't forget to be back with us on Wednesday night as we continue on with the Iwana uh, program, the Faith Works for the Teens. And then I will continue on in the series of messages, uh, the names of God, name above all names. And this week we will do El Elyon, and you will enjoy that. So be with us on Wednesday night. 
And then also, let me mention that in two weeks, we have our World Missions Day, and a very special day is we think more about our outreach into the world, and it'll be special things that day, some unusual things also, and uh, that you'll enjoy that. And so I hope that you'll be with us on that day, and uh, that'll be a very special time. Also on that Sunday, we begin a new uh, a new Bible study class for our young married couples called As One, and uh, that will be uh, done by the Fernandez, and so I hope that you will be a part of that if you're falling in that category of 20s and 30s, and, uh, and tell others about it. Uh, some of you may already have, you may have married children in that category. Encourage them to be in it. Everybody needs to be in the Bible study classes. Everybody does. And uh, so I want to encourage everyone to be part of it, but uh, just highlighting also this new one that we're starting. And if you have any questions about it, make sure that you see the Fernandez and they'll be able to help you with that. Also, let me mention to you this, that as many of you know, we're going to Israel. Uh, April and I are taking our fifth group to Israel. We'll do that next year, uh, the end of February. And just reminding you about that, that that date is coming up for the deposit. If you want to go on that trip, is November 15th has to be in by. And if you have any questions, make sure you see us. Uh, it's a wonderful time. I had a privilege of um, the last couple of days been been preaching at a couples conference, and April and I were there and talked to a pastor that's going in two or three weeks for the first time. And I said, "Man, you'll never forget it," and just giving him some a little help there. And so it is a great opportunity. And if you can do that or have any questions about it, make sure that you see us, and we'll be glad to help you with that. Let me introduce our our guest that'll be uh, here with us today, Ray. And Ann Gibbs, and in a moment, guys, I'll have you come and we'll pray. But after uh, I have the prayer for the offering, they're going to come and sing for us. Uh, I probably heard Ray and Ann Gibbs, I don't know how many years ago, for the first time. And what a, what a blessing they were from that very time. And uh, for many years now, I've just enjoyed so much uh, hearing them sing. And, and, and let me say this knowing the heart behind the singing is amazing. To, not only just the gift that God has given them. And you know, I kind of think about this, you know, when I hear Brother Ray sing, and, and uh, I, I say him, nothing against Ann, but I can't sing as high as Ann. I can't sing as high as Ray. I can't sing near that. But I'm going to tell you this. One day, Brother Gibbs, I'm about, one day when we get to heaven, I'll be able to sing like him. And I'm going to stand right next to him, and I'm going to say, how do you like this? And he's probably going to say, I knew you'd get there, Pastor. And... Uh, but I, I tell you what, to hear them sing and to hear their love for the Lord is going to be a blessing to your heart today. And I know that they will. They, they just have that about them, a true love for Christ and a great, great ability that God has given them. Uh, for, for many years they have sung professionally and, uh, and in the education field of educating others and now really still doing some of that, but a lot is just going around the country and being a blessing in churches and I know they will be today. So I know that they're going to be a blessing to you. And so guys, if you'll come, let's receive the offering. And uh, right after the offering, uh, the Gibbs will come and uh, sing for us and be a blessing to us today. So let's ask the Lord to bless as we give. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege we have of giving. And it is an honor to be able to do that, to be in obedience to you. And so, Father, we ask that you will just now bless this, use it, multiply it in a mighty way. And thank you again for all you do in your provisions. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed. mercy his child and forever I am redeemed and so happy in Jesus no language my rapture can tell I know that the light of his presence with me doth continually dwell redeemed Shall 
Scripture reading this morning is found in the book of Titus, 
chapter 2, Titus, if you'll turn there with me in your Bibles. Titus, the second chapter, beginning in verse 1, says this, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becoming, becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. I saw one hanging on a tree in agony and blood. He fixed his loving eyes on me As near his cross I stood Oh, can it be upon a tree The Savior died for me My soul is thrilled My heart is filled To think he died for me. Sure, never till my latest breath shall I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. Oh, can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me? My soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think he died for me. second look he gave which said I freely all forgive this blood is for thy ransom paid I die that thou mayst live oh can it be upon a tree the Savior died for me my soul is thrilled, my heart is filled to think he died for 
Amen. Thank you, thank you, Brother Gibbs, so much for that song. Love that song. Words are written by John Newton. And a beautiful, beautiful song. It's one of those that, about five songs that I can listen to over and over again and never get tired of. And that one itself has a great message to it. Thank you so much for it. If you have your Bibles today, open the book of 1 Kings chapter number 10. 1 Kings chapter number 10. And I'll read that portion of Scripture here in just a moment. But it's so good to see you in God's house. Isn't it a beautiful time of year too? Man, I love the fall. How many of you, fall is your favorite time of year? Anybody here besides me? Yeah. How many of you like summer the best? Wow, a lot of you do. How about spring? All right. That it? Oh, there's four. How many of you looking forward to winter? Uh, a couple of you are. Wow. Most of them are teachers looking for snow days. Amazing how that works. But I do love the fall. Um, I, I like when the leaves change and, and uh, all the things go with it. And the temperatures get a little cooler. And um, we were out this last part of the week. Is, uh, I preached three times at a couples conference, uh, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then uh, April spoke also there. And we drove home yesterday from, from that area. And, and I just kind of took a few back roads and, and just... Uh, just had a good time just driving over the little hills and watching the, you know, looking at the corn. He said, Pastor, you're strange. Doesn't take much to entertain me. And, uh, but just beautiful out there and just enjoyed it so much. And uh, I, I get in the car with April and I'll go anywhere. Anywhere she'll go, I'll go. And um, so anyways, we had a good time with it though and uh, praise the Lord for it. But just love this time of year and it always is a blessing to see it. Always think of the harvest and all that when you come to this time. But uh, good to see you in God's house today. 1 Kings chapter number 10. Notice verse number 1. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great train. Uh, just for some of you, the word train there means uh, not choo-choo, <laughs> locomotive, all right? Uh, just a, a long line that came with her to bring what she had, and we'll talk about that in a moment. With camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Sol Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. When the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believe not the words till I came. Mine eyes had seen, and behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceeded the fame which I heard. Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants which stand continually before thee, and that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. And she gave the king 120 talents of gold, and of spices, very great store, and precious stones. There came no much, no much more such abundance of spices as that these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. And the navy also of Hiram, they brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir great plenty of almond trees and precious stones. And the king made of the almond trees pillars for the house of the Lord and for the king's house. Harps also, psalteries for singers. There came no such almug trees, nor were seen unto this day. And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. There was a lady that lived in the country of the Sabaeans, S-A-B-E-A-N-S. That is Sheba. You may have seen that name uh, other places in Scripture. There is a lady who was the queen there. You just read her account. 
You can picture what had happened and the fact that she is there on her throne there in Sheba. She's 1,400 miles east of him. She's in what's modern day Yemen. And there she is and she keeps hearing this all the time. There's a guy 1,400 miles from here named Solomon. People would come by and say, man, he is so smart. And she got tired of hearing Solomon this, Solomon that. She probably heard about the house that he built. She heard about all the things that he had done. She heard about the wisdom. She heard about all these things. And, you know, sometimes it's just Solomon this, Solomon that. I'm going to go see if this guy is really all he's cracked up to be. This is the story of a seeker. So that's what I give you for the title of the message today. The story of a seeker. Now, she was already from a wealthy country as it is. That nation at that time, very well off. Now, let me say, if you go back and think in your mind, going back here to this time frame, Solomon comes to the throne, I think somewhere around 971 B.C. All right, so most of us weren't around. Brother Cox was close, but not all the way, all right? But 971 B.C., he assumes the throne. Solomon's about 20 years old when he becomes king. He spends the next 20 years building the temple and building his own palace. And let me say this, it was remarkable. I don't believe the world to this day, uh, and I know these two are gone, these, the palace and the temple, but I want to say to this day, I don't think the world has ever seen anything like that. I think to this day the world has seen anything as uh, immaculate as that temple, that, that first temple was, and then the palace of Solomon itself. So she hears all this, and you can imagine as she gets ready for a journey, all right, no planes, no trains, no automobiles, so she begins a 1,400-mile journey going due west to come to the area of Jerusalem to hear and to see what this guy is all about. So this is a long journey, but it so intrigued her what she heard. She had to understand, is it true? Is it really legitimate? Is there such a one that has that kind of uh, knowledge that he had? Let me show you something to get kind of interesting here, just kind of give this to you. And I learned this in the study, not from this book, but from another place. But the Koran actually gives this story in it. They just do what the Koran always does. They lie. Oh, Pastor, did you say that? Yes. The Koran is full of lies. Hypocrisy against God. Out and out tool of the devil. It's a fact. Matter of fact, the Koran gives this account. The Koran gives this and written to them in the 7th century A.D. is when they record it out. And they say that, that this woman heard about Solomon and she went to see Solomon and had a battle of wits. And Solomon was a follower of Allah and he converted her over to Allah. He said, what do you call that? Hogwash. You know what hogwash is, don't you? Stuff they wash hogs in. That's exactly what it is. But they give the account. And let me say also, just giving you this, that is much of what Islam does. Takes things from the Word of God, twist it the way it wants it to make it, and totally fabricate it, and change it over to glorify a dead God. But they give us account that way anyhow. I just throw that out to you. But she comes and she really wants to see exactly what is going on. And so let's break it down a little bit and just learn a little bit about the story of a seeker. Notice if you would in verse number one, the reason she came. You understand that already. She heard of the fame of Solomon. She heard the reports. Now when she comes for, as queen of Sheba, the Sabaeans, comes these 1,400 miles west, this is not coming as a state visit. This is coming because she wants answers. She heard, and she wants to see if it lines up to what's true. And what is really the factual things about Solomon. So it's not some kind of a state visit that way. Now there's no doubt Solomon had been blessed of God. Solomon honored the Lord. Solomon tried to do what is right before God. So she hears these reports and away she comes 
This one is more than a report of just a name. Notice in verse number one why I say that. Because she comes concerning the name of the Lord. Isn't that interesting? So apparently it was more than just hearing about Solomon and his wisdom and Solomon and his wealth and the palace and the temple and all those things. But rather it was this, that she heard of the name of the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. It is of Jehovah God. So she heard of the name of the Lord because you see when, uh, when a true one who's a follower of Christ loves the Lord so much, they want to make sure that the Lord is reflected in everything they say and do. And so when the wisdom came out from Solomon, all those things, it was all pointing to Jehovah God. And so she heard of all these things concerning the name of the Lord. Solomon's connection with Jehovah uh, separated him from everybody else, separated him from all the other rulers of the world, separated him from all the others that are in a head of a state. This one was different. This guy was different than everyone else because there was something unique about him. It all came from Jehovah God. Pretty remarkable when you know that's the story behind it. And let me say Solomon attributed all his prosperity to the Lord. And so, anyways, this is why she came. Matter of fact, look at verse number one, the last part. She came to prove him with hard questions. She came to ask him some things that were difficult. You see, what I find so intriguing here, it wasn't the wealth that intrigued her. It wasn't the wealth that she wanted to see. It was the fact that he had answers. I want to say this to you. Please listen. The world will not be intrigued by your wealth. Because right now some of you are saying, well, that's easy. You have to have it for them to be intrigued. All right? The world's not going to be intrigued with that. They can see people with wealth. They can see people with fame. They see Hollywood and its fame. And boy, Hollywood's taking a beating. And rightfully so. So they, they can, the world can see all that. What they really want to see is someone that understands what is life all about. How do I have a relationship with God? How can I have peace in my life? How can I be at peace with God? How can I have eternal life? Listen, that's what the world needs to see. That's what they want to see. It's not the wealth that intrigues. It's not any of those things. It ought to, they ought to see in us Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They ought to see Him in us, and that is intriguing to the world. They want to know, what is life all about? She came to ask Him questions. Matter of fact, look at the words. She came to prove Him. Man, she came with some hard questions. Notice the reason she came. But I want to show you a second. Look at verse 2 and 3. Not only the reason she came, but the remarks that she heard. Notice as she comes to Jerusalem, verse number 2, and she comes with a great load of stuff. She comes with this great train. This great, I mean, could you imagine if you're out there in the desert and you see this, this train coming by, all those camels loaded down with all kinds of stuff. What are they loaded down with? They give us an idea of in verse 2. They're bearing spices. They're bearing very much gold, and we know how much in just a little bit. They're bearing precious stones. They're bringing all these things when she was come to Solomon. She is coming to meet the most renowned man on the planet. And it looks like as if she's coming down uh, across the desert and with this great load of stuff, almost as if she comes with a small army of all these kinds of things. She's going to figure out what is this guy all about. And so notice the remarks that she heard. Look at verse number uh, 2. Then the last part, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. She asked him every question she had. How, does it, how do you like when people ask you questions? Well, it depends on the topic, doesn't it? How many of you have a three-year-old? Anybody here have a three-year-old? All right. Anybody have three-year-old grandchildren too? We'll throw them in too. That'll add some of you to it. How many of you remember having a three-year-old? Good. Let's get everybody to vote now. How many were a three-year-old? 
All right, thank you very much. Don't want anyone to feel left out. All right. Three-year-olds ask questions all the time. Well, why is that, Dad? Who made that? How did that happen? All three of our kids did those kind of questions. And by the way, I always gave them the same answer. Ask your mother. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, you know, questions come when kids are that way. Let me give you a little something. Parenting here also. Answer them. Answer questions. Don't let it be a bother to you. I'm so glad here Solomon didn't say, hey, you know what? I don't want to answer all these questions. She came seeking what was the truth. Thank God that she did come that way. Matter of fact, look at verse number 3. Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. Whatever was in her heart, she asked him, he answered. How did this come about? He'd give an answer. She may have asked a question like this, how did the world come into being? And he probably gave her what Moses recorded out of God in Genesis chapter number 1. Say, so what did he say to her in the beginning? God created the heaven and the earth. See, the God's answer hasn't changed. So he would have answered, this is how it came about. You see, she was intrigued because she came, remember, back verse number one, concerning the name of the Lord. So she's asking questions and he's giving answers and it must have been something uh, to really be there. Could you imagine being in on that discussion? She wanted to figure out exactly what is going on and so she would travel wherever she needed to to get these answers. Now, I thought about this as I was getting ready for this a number of weeks ago. This is not something of convenience. See, we live in a very age of everything's convenient to us. Is it not? Right, now, listen, some of you out there right now, you've got a smartphone in your pocket, or, or you're on it right now. Uh, yeah, I'm looking at the scriptures, Pastor. Okay, we'll stay there, all right? But you know what, you can, you can right now get on that phone and uh, don't do this right now, but you can punch in whatever you want to know and you can hit send, you can Google and out it goes and then in just a few seconds you've got an answer back. Life is so convenient now. So we think. And so sometimes what happens is we don't like to do things that are inconvenient. I'm convinced that this woman said, you know what, this is not a convenient trip to go 1,400 miles, but I have to have answers. Let me just give you something. If you know Christ as your personal Savior, please listen to me today. Listen to this. Don't ever treat people when they have answers and they want answers about Christ as an inconvenience to you. Well, I'm busy right now, all right? Stop being so busy and answer the question about Christ. Listen, we, as I told my Sunday school class today in our Bible study time, I said we live in an age today where the harvest truly is plenteous. People just want someone to take a few moments and share with them what life is all about. And you say, well, it's not always convenient. There's a lot of things in life that aren't convenient. There's a lot of things in life that just take some of our time, some of our energy, some of our effort, but I am convinced of this, if we will do those things and we will give people the truth of the Word of God and we will lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, He will draw all men to Him. He just needs someone to lift Him up. This was inconvenient, but it was exactly what was needed. Matter of fact, as I think of them, I, or I think of the Queen of Sheba, I think of the Berean believers and Acts chapter 17, they heard things and they searched the scriptures to see if they were so. Interesting. Look at verse 4 and 5 then. I want you to see a third thing in this story. There's the review she receives. The review she receives. Look at verse 4. 
And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that had been built and the meat of his table, the sitting of his servants, the attendance of his ministers, their apparel, the cupbearers, his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. All right, let me take all that, those two verses, and explain in one word what she was receiving. Here's the word, overload. She came in with the questions. She was getting these answers. She had her eyes open. She was viewing things all around her. And you can only imagine the kingdom that she was seeing. And she never saw anything like it before. Matter of fact, quickly, look what caught her attention in verse number four. First of all, the wisdom. Uh, all of Solomon's wisdom, that caught her attention. And then his palace in verse 4, that caught her attention. And then they get a little more specific. In, in, in verse number 5, the food caught her attention. The meat of his table, that probably would have caught my attention first. Notice what else caught her attention, the order of his palace. Let me tell you what, I believe Solomon had people working like clockwork being where they're supposed to be at the time they're supposed to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. I mean, it was boom, boom, boom. The order that was all around him. And even it caught the attention, notice this, the apparel of the people around him. Even those that were working for him and his cupbearers. And notice this, it also caught our attention. His ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord. Let me give you quickly, because you better understand this. There's another passage of Scripture that gives us a lot more detail about it a little later when Rehoboam comes to the throne, who was Solomon's son. And Rehoboam was not a man of God. Rehoboam allowed uh, himself to be taken over by another nation. But needless to say, here's what happens. When Solomon would come to the temple, here's exactly what they would do. Solomon had these, these shields made. They were incredible. They were beautiful. They were shields of total gold. I mean, they would just, they would, they had, they had two different sizes. He had these larger ones, and then he had these smaller ones. It even gives us later on in Scripture how uh, much gold was in each one, one of them. Each one, if you want to do in today's standards, was probably close, the large ones, close to $100,000 each. Solid gold, and what they would do, they would take these shields, and a servant would hold them on one side, and there'd be big ones, and there'd be small ones, and they would do this. They would line them up on one side, and line them up on the other side, and these shields would be there, and here's what would happen. Anytime Solomon would go to the temple and walk to it, as he was coming into the temple, all these would be lined up, and he would walk into the temple with all these shields of solid gold on each side which in that Mideast sun, and when the sun would hit that, it must have been breathtaking. So while she's there apparently, she sees him make that track to the temple and sees these shields of gold. Interesting story, Rehoboam has them taken by the king of uh, Egypt a little later on. King of Egypt comes up, takes those for his own, and he makes shields of brass. Hey, listen to me, which would you rather have? You see, Rehoboam lived the life of a phony. Everything he did in life was a phony. That's another message, another time. I just needed you to know it. But this is what she saw as he would come up. You know what she was seeing? This guy is so devoted to Jehovah God. It had caught her attention to the point where in verse number 5, she is overwhelmed. There was no more spirit in her. And so in verse 6 through 9, we see the fourth thing. We see the report she gave. Notice verse 6. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in my own land of thy acts of thy wisdom. Rarely I find this in life are things all they're cracked up to be. <laughs> You're driving down the road. You see a big billboard. All right, you see that and you say, wow, look at that, that place, that must be spectacular. You drive up I-95 on the east coast, south of the border. Wow. You go through the middle heart of the country, come see Ruby Falls. I'm dating myself, but that's all right. I lived in Chattanooga for years. 
He said, man, uh, I, I always get a kick out of those billboards, especially south of the border. I like the one that says, keep screaming, kids, they'll stop. My favorite one. And so you arrive, and I'm not trying to slam south of the border, but it is what you see when you get there. You go, what? <laughs> Tourist trap, what? This isn't what it's all cracked up to be. Someone says, man, you got to try this restaurant. It's the best food you ever had. And then they bring it out to you, and you can barely eat it. Oh, this is wonderful. Rarely are things all they're cracked up to be. And a lot of times, you know as well as I do, we leave life disappointed or an event disappointed. Wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Notice what she says. It's a true report. Matter of fact, she says later, this is it, what I heard is not even half of what it really is. It's bigger than I thought. There's more wisdom than I ever thought. The, the Jehovah God is stronger than I ever imagined. You say, why is that? Because in verse number 7, she says, the skepticism is gone. I believe not the words till I came. Mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told. This exceeds the fame that I heard. The skepticism is gone. The cynicism is gone. It is what I've heard. God is who he says he is. And the wisdom that God has bestowed upon you is exactly even more than I ever dreamed it could be. Let me tell you what. When the Bible says taste and see that the Lord is good, and then when you taste and see, you will never walk away disappointed. You come out and you'll say, Boy, that was better than I ever thought it could be. And you read something in the Word of God and you'll say, wow, look at what God taught me in it. You'll take something, you'll see how God works in your life. And you say, oh Lord, thank you for letting me taste this. Thank you for letting me see this. Oh Lord, you are so good. Hey, can I say this? When's the last time you really felt that way too? Now I'll tell you what it is. If you're not getting that, it's not because of His Word. It's not because of Him. It's because of you. Because it's always good. She stepped out of there and said, this is more than I ever thought. Verse number 8, she says, your servants are blessed. Happier the people get to spend time with you. You see, that's exactly what people say to my wife. I'm happy to be with her. Verse number 9, she gives credit where credit's due. I love this. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee to set thee on the throne of Israel. I read different commentators over the years that have talked about this passage. Some would say, well, I don't know if she became a follower of Jehovah God or not. My opinion is yes. It's my opinion. But all I know is in verse number 9, it's quite a testimony to the Lord. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice. Finishing out, look at the last few verses. Verse 10 through 13, notice the last point, the riches she gave and received. Verse number 10, she gives him 120 talents of gold. All right, let me give you a little help here very quickly. 120 talents of gold is, please watch this, that is four ton. Now, some of you just woke up. Four ton. Four ton of gold in today's, today's money would be close to $150 billion. I think she got saved. <laughs> That's what I think. But nonetheless, she says, I'm, I'm so overwhelmed by this. Here, take this. And then she gives him spices like never been done before. Verse 13, he gives some gifts to her. King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all, she, all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. Amazing. All right, now listen, before we finish in just a moment, that's quite the story, is it not? I think it's pretty intriguing. Story of a seeker. She's mentioned one more time. You have your Bibles, I'll show you one more passage, and we're finished. Look at Matthew chapter number 12. Matthew chapter number 12. 
Because what we've just finished looking at is not the end of the story. It's an incredible story. It's not the end of the story. Matthew chapter number 12, Christ talks about it. He elevates it and brings it right where we need it. Notice one verse, Jesus himself speaking, verse 42. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. What's Jesus telling us? This is not the end of the story because Jesus uses it here. He's talking about and out to the crowd that day to the unbelievers of his day. Those who looked at the Lord Jesus Christ and said, you're not the Son of God. The Pharisees, the Sadducees. He says this about her in verse 42. She traveled hundreds of miles, watch this, to meet a mortal man. Is that what Solomon was? Yes or no? Yes, for time's sake, please help me. Yes, a mortal man. And Jesus said she would travel all that way to do that. But he looked at the crowd when he spoke that day. And he said, here before you is a son of God. Watch, and you won't even extend a hand. A greater than Solomon is here. She would come 1,400 miles to meet a mortal man because she heard about his story about him. She heard about his power. She heard about his wisdom. She heard about all these things. And she did not go away disappointed. He said, here, the Son of God is. I mean, you won't even give it the time of day. What she did will condemn you, he says. So when Jesus is speaking this, he is saying, here is a Gentile queen who acknowledges Jehovah God, but the Jewish leaders of that day, watch, would not even recognize him as Messiah. So therefore, he says, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. So right now you're saying, okay, pastor, what does this have to do with us? Let me ask you a few things here as we finish. What intrigues you? What intrigues you? What are some things if you see them, you say, wow, that, that really is, that's interesting. That really intrigues me. Nothing wrong with that. All right, let me say this one more time to you. Let me go a step further. What overwhelms you sometimes? Pastor, everyday life. <laughs> what are the things that just overwhelm you? Let's use a term we probably understand. What blows your mind? What comes to the point where your mind just says, wow, I can't even fathom that. Now, I'll be honest with you, I probably have a simple mind. Leaves changing colors intrigue me. We were just gone two or three days. We drove down this main road to our house, and man, it seemed like it, boom, overnight, just wow. I look at April, look at that as we drove down it. It didn't take much to excite me. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me now. I still can't get over what God has done for us. I still can't get over that book. I'm in that book every day, reading it, reading it, reading it, and I sometimes look at that precious Word of God, and I'll just say this, man, I just can't, I just can't believe God would do that. What a God. Maybe you say, well, pastor, I, I don't feel that way anymore. Watch, maybe you should. Well, I've been at Arlington for 50 years. I've heard it all. You, let me tell you what, this book is as fresh today as it's ever been. 
If the staleness is, is there in your life, it's not the Bible, it's you. When's the last time you got in the scriptures and you couldn't put it down or you read something and you go, look at that. Hey, I'll go a step further. When's the last time you've been in the Word of God? When's the last time you walked out of a service, maybe like last Sunday when someone trusted Christ, you just walked out and said, boy, wasn't that good. I just don't get excited that way, Pastor. Maybe you should. You see, this lady walked away. She got with, on her camel. Maybe she didn't walk. I'm sorry. She maybe rode the camel. I've been on a camel. I'd rather walk. I've been on an elephant. I'd rather walk. But let me say this. She went 1,400 miles home, and here's what she did the whole way home. That was amazing. That was amazing. I can't believe that. That's phenomenal. If I hadn't heard it and seen it, that was amazing. Could you imagine what she liked when she got back? And everyone came to her because she heard all these accounts of Solomon. And so imagine when she gets back and they look at her and say, well, what did you see? He said, it's, it's, she goes, it's bigger than I thought. It's more ornate than I thought. Jehovah God is more mighty and more powerful and more brilliant than I ever thought. When's the last time you got that? Hmm. I wonder sometimes where are we at in life and what we're seeking. Let me ask you the last question. What are you seeking? Seeking fame? You won't want it when you get it. Are you seeking wealth? It'll stay for a while and it'll blow out like the wind. You'll have it one day and gone the next. Or you'll have it till you die. And I'm going to tell you what, I don't care what they tell you, you are not taking it with you. What are you going to do? What are you seeking? I just want joy in life, Pastor. All right, watch. Here it is. There it is. There it is. I just want peace. There it is. I just want contentment. There it is. I just want a purpose in life. There it is. A number of weeks ago, I preached this message to you, and you'll never hopefully forget it. What you seek is what you get. She sought, and she got, and it blew her mind. What are you seeking today? Heavenly Father, thank you for what you've taught us in your word. The entrance of thy word giveth light. Use this. Use this message. Use this passage. Use this in our lives. Challenge us. Father, for those that may get a little staleness in their life, let them eat the fresh bread today. Let him drink some more of the living water. Open our eyes that we may see and behold wondrous things in thy word. Oh, Lord, you're a great God. Thank you for what you've taught us. With our heads bowed and eyes closed and no one looking around, I wonder today there might be someone that says, Pastor, I don't even know for sure if I die and go to heaven. Hope so, maybe so, but don't know for sure. You say, Pastor Campbell, would you pray for me? I do not know for sure if I died, go to heaven. Would you pray for me? With our heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just slip your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I do not know for sure. Would you pray for me? Anyone at all as I look around, not to embarrass you, just to pray for you, anyone at all. I preach basically to believers today. I do want to ask this question, though. Please listen if you know Christ. Maybe today you would say, you know, Pastor, what I need is maybe a freshness again. And need that once again. I don't care whether you're a teenager, single, married, young adult, middle age, senior adult. You'd say, Pastor, I need that today. I need a freshness. What will I do about it? Tell the Lord. Tell him right now. Lord, there's some things in my life that have 
kept me, kind of gave me a little staleness, and maybe I need that freshness once again. I need to seek things out in your word again. Tell him it. In a moment, I encourage you to use the altar. I'm a firm believer in an altar. I think sometimes it's good for us to put movement into our feet to what God does in our heart. I want our church to be a place where people can know here's where they can get the truth of the word of God. If someone were to travel 1,400 miles, I want them to walk in this place and say, ah, I heard about Jesus. God speak in your heart. I'm going to invite you to come in a moment. Now, Father, use this invitation for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing softly and tenderly. It'll be on the screen.